Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Neo Systems CMMC Town Hall. Now, I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neo Systems. Ed, thanks, Don. Welcome, everyone, to our continuing series of Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions on cybersecurity maturity model certification. Um, my guest today is uh, Chuck Durant. Also joining is uh, Wade Forbes, who's sketch noting the conversation with us, and we'll send out some copies of that to the attendees after the after the session is over. I do want to remind everyone that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the defense industrial base. Our focus at Neo Systems as a managed service provider is primarily on organizations that are seeking certification under CMMC. Um, that's mostly who we have in our audience today. And I want to encourage everyone in the audience to send in their questions on the Q&A uh, feature within Zoom. I'll work those questions into the conversation with Chuck as much as, um, as, much as possible. Um, I'll start with the introduction. Uh, Charles Durant. So Chuck is the is the director of the field intelligence element of the National Security Sciences Directorate at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, Chuck has a background with the Department of Energy, holding the post of deputy director for counterintelligence and the director of the operations and investigations division. He's also held counterintelligence roles with the White House military office and in the Department of Defense. So Chuck, thanks uh, very much for, for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We appreciate you calling in from your hotel room in Washington, D.C., so on the, on the road, but, but still able to join. We appreciate that. Um, so, you know, with your wide counterintelligence background, certainly you, you know a thing or two about how our nation state adversaries are stealing our intellectual property and hopefully some advice on how to, how to stop them that will, will help our audience out. Um, we, we've, we've seen recently some really sophisticated, you know, state-sponsored attacks they're targeting software supply chain. They're extorting money through ransomware. These are broad scale attacks and they're using indirect means to go after large numbers of high value targets being successful in some cases. Is, is, this, is this new or are we just newly aware of some of these, these tactics? You know, I think frankly, it's a combination of both. Um, I think we are getting better at recognizing it, um, but also the, the attack is always, they're always evolving their, their methodology to attack us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm living in my world, you know, I've seen uh, in some cases on critical infrastructure and stuff, adversaries have actually been targeting it for over a decade. Um, but what's becoming more sophisticated is the way they're doing it. And then, of course, this ability to obfuscate who the actor is um, by, by changing their tactics. So, I mean, we're talking about like uh, when we talk about ransomware, you know, we've known for quite some time that North Korea was doing uh, ransomware and other types of financial attacks and then using that money to, to fund like uh, technology development in their weapons program in North Korea because of the sanctions um, that the United States and other countries have put on them. Uh, but more recently, what we've seen in the last two years is this development of uh, ransomware as a service. And instead of just locking up computers, actually kind of copying the tactics, techniques and procedures, if you will, of uh, nation state actors and actually trying to be more surreptitious about getting into the corporate networks, um, exfiltrating data uh, discreetly, uh, and then locking down the computers and using that data to, um, to blackmail the company to pay the ransom. Um, but that, that being said, even with like recent events, like with uh, colonial, the Colonial Pipeline or, or solar winds, you know, sometimes uh, you wonder if the nation state actor could also be hiding or leveraging criminal elements within their country uh, to obfuscate because that changes the nature of the response from the United States or from other nation states, right? Are we dealing with a criminal actor or are we dealing with a, an intelligence service that changes the level of response quite a bit um, because we're not going to necessarily use kinetic response or, uh, or other uh, aspects of our, uh, what DOD can do against a uh, criminal enterprise where we might be Feel, we might feel more justified as a nation to do that against a nation state actor. So I, I'll stop with that. So when you, when you said they're using the ransomware payments to fund their weapon system development, my, my first thought was maybe that's sort of like having a bake sale to, to, to build missiles. But, yep. but with this kind of ransoms we're seeing today, it's a big bake sale. So <laughs> they're bringing in some exactly. pretty good dollars, you know, to where it might make a difference in their defense budget, I guess. Um, so, you know, I, are these the sort of thing that are at the top of your agenda, field intelligence unit that you're running? You know, cyber is not the entire world, obviously. There's other, other kinds of things yep. going on. How do these 
kind of cyber attacks fit into that bigger picture? Are, are they top, bottom, middle? Where do they fit in there? Um, they definitely fit in. And, you know, for the national laboratories and for Oak Ridge National Laboratory right now, um, these types of things are getting a lot of attention. Uh, you know, the national labs do a lot of our work based on a partnership, either with a federal partner or a private sector partner that wants to leverage the research capabilities that a national laboratory has. But uh, I will say that, like, if you were to go to the Oak Ridge website and look up at the, uh, at the National Security Sciences Directorate, we're very focused on what we're now calling vulnerability science, which means looking at both software, hardware, um, IT systems, and, and, and other technical systems saying, what are the vulnerabilities in those systems and how do we conduct research and development to find ways to mitigate those vulnerabilities or mitigate the threats coming from nation state or criminal actors uh, to protect national security here in the United States. So it's, it is very much a priority and it's a very broad area and there's more than enough work for all of the national laboratories. Uh, when you look at the, the breadth of the companies and the, it, you know, there's 16 sectors under PPD uh, 21. Um, in the, uh, the sector I'm most familiar with is the electricity sector. There's over 3000 electric company utilities in the electric sector alone. Then start throwing in all the vendors and all the supply chain and you start to get an idea of how huge the problem is if you're looking across all 16 sectors and how do you protect those and all the subcomponents that they rely on to make their networks function. So numbers are, yeah, those numbers are big. And looking in, um, you know, as we've looked at CMMC, looks at the Department of Defense industrial base, they're estimating 300 to 350,000 companies. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge yep. swath of, of American, American business. So, so with the ransomware, you know, we, we've seen that where money seems to be the goal. Um, we've seen installation of back doors to enable persistent access. So the solar winds attack, for example, that are more about sort of stealing data over time. You brought up the idea that you might have, a, you might have intelligence service backing what looks to be on the outside, a, a criminal enterprise. Um, you know, what's your, what's your take on those motivations? It sounds like they're getting woven together is, is you mentioned using the ransom payments to fund weapons system development. I, I, I know for sure, sometimes they're funding espionage or they're funding further attacks, right? They're basically being able to raise their game in terms of the, the kind of, target they're able to go after. Um, what do you make of their relationship between those actors? Is, is that, you know, are, are these really interwoven to where there's, there's no difference between the people trying to steal our money and the people trying to steal our secrets or are they still somewhat separate? Um, they're still somewhat separate, but you know, it's, it's clear in some cases that there's a relationship. I mean, I think there's been some open source reporting of seeing some common signatures um, in a couple different environments. So, uh, perhaps uh, some of the actors go back and forth, or I remember back a few years ago, I think it was even in a FireEye report that, um, you know, there was, there was some thought that some of the criminal actors were actually freelancers um, working after hours after doing their, their, their intelligence work, if you will. In the evening, they were hacking for personal gain and, uh, and uh, going after people's personal accounts using those skills. Um, for their own personal purposes. So, so they are intertwined uh, to some degree. And I think, you know, we're seeing that again now, I think with uh, nation states leveraging some of the um, criminal actors that are more in their country or more uh, complicit, because again, that obfuscates and kind of confuses, you know, who actually did this and what was the purpose. Um, and uh, when you look at the, the, the ransomware, you know, the, one of the examples I was thinking about preparing for this talk was uh, NotPetya, for an example. So when you looked at NotPetya, um, there's open source reporting that when you look, it really wasn't about ransomware. It was made to look like ransomware. It locked up the computers like ransomware. But at the end of the day, there was really no place to pay a ransom. And there was no key that was going to be given to you to un unlock your computers. I mean, the the purpose was uh, different than ransomware. It was meant to disrupt, it was meant to destroy, um, but it wasn't meant to actually recoup any money or, or charge people. So uh, I think we're gonna see more of those things going into the future because they want to take and confuse the space uh, to make it harder to tell who it is. Um, another example I could just throw out really briefly is when you looked at, uh, I don't know if everyone remembers when the Seoul Olympics kicked off, there was the, uh, the malicious emails and, and spear phishing and malware um, at the start of the Seoul Olympics. 
And I think uh, when you look at some of the articles, the initial indicators where everybody thought it was North Korea, and then now it's come out in the public domain that it was actually Russia, um, making it look like it was North Korea. <clears throat> and they were doing that in retaliation for the Russian doping scandal of their athletes. Hmm. Um, they were upset with the Olympic Committee for saying the Russians couldn't participate in the Seoul Olympics. So, it, so there's a whole variety of things that are happening now that are making this problem more sophisticated and putting U.S. companies and other Western companies on the leading edge of, of the space, you know, as far as um, influence and using cyber for influence operations during peacetime. You mentioned NotPetya. My take on that was that it was, you know, Russia versus the Ukraine, but it ended up sort of being a targeting problem where they had a huge amount of collateral damage, where the collateral damage was, you know, yep. 90%, right? The intended target um, was the Ukrainian systems running Ukrainian accounting software and ended up affecting on a much larger basis. But lately we've seen, you know, sort of just, it looks like intentional targeting of things that are ubiquitous. For sure that might've not been intentional, right? It may have, it may have succeeded spectacularly beyond the, the original actor's intentions, but with, you know, going after the Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities, we've seen widespread exploitation. Um, SolarWinds Orion obviously planned specifically because it's widely deployed in, in a large number of places. Um, that seems like the likelihood of, of threat actors, you know, operating inside our perimeter is rel reasonably high. In other words, it used to be that the, the, the chances were low just because there were so many targets and not that many attackers. But now that the attackers are, are doing these sort of mass, you know, mass casualty events, um, last week our guest on this series spoke about adopting an assumed breach security posture where you, you know, you kind of assume that there's probably some bad folks running around in there. Do you think that's warranted? I mean, is that is that the right way to think about securing our systems, do you think? I think so. I think, you know, in many of the conversations I've been in, we've had discussions about, you know, for many years we focused on, as, as someone um, put it, trying to create this hard, crunchy outer shell to our networks and put, you know, the defensive posture on the perimeter and defend ourselves. And the reality is that um, this is almost like dealing with terrorism. They're sitting overseas for very low, low cost. They can come at us multiple times. And at the end of the day, they only have to be successful once. It only takes a couple people to click on that spear phishing email. And once they get into the network, if you're only focused on the external aspects, they have complete lateral movement. And, you know, you see all the reporting on stolen credentials and everything. So you have to assume that your network is going to be compromised. Um, you've got to have zero trust, and then you've got to have that segmentation and tools in there to capture when someone is uh, doing lateral movement across the systems where they should not be allowed to or they're exceeding their privileges um, and getting into areas of the system they should not be in. So um, that's been a pretty consistent theme. You know, the um, NSA Information Assurance Directorate actually put out some time ago um, the IAD Top 10. And um, that had about 10 recommendations that they felt if those were implemented, those would have reduced the number of successful cyber attacks at that time by over 80%. Hmm. And one of those things was micro, you know, with segmentation. I'm sorry. Segmentation. Yeah. And I think it's a little bit different way of thinking. And I just to, you know, use a maybe a overused analogy, but, you know, the, the thinking I think used to be if you did a good job of security, you could avoid getting hacked. And so, you know, it was that thing of, don't you know you don't have to be faster than the bear you just have to be faster than everybody else right so that you, yep. some other people become softer targets they get attacked you don't because you're a little harder it's a little bit harder than than yep. the general population but if um if the attacks are you know happening on such a broad scale then even well defended um even the fast runners get caught by the bear in that in that scenario yeah. right so, I, so that means pretty much everybody has to be in a, in a mindset that yeah they're probably have been going to be are in the process of being um you know bad things happening within their within their system so then mm -hmm. you have to change your change your approach um let's dive a little deeper into that sort of appropriate response right so most of most of our audience are defense industrial base i know you're coming from more of a doe perspective but you know these are companies that very much don't want to be victimized by these attacks right they but they don't have access to counterintelligence expertise or, or in, in really even much intelligence on the threat for that matter. How, how do they tap into your world, the CI world, um, in a useful way that lets them do a better job of, of handling these threats? 
Well, you know, um, one of the things that's been happening over the last couple of years is um, a lot more information is coming out on the open side, right? Um, I still remember, I remember the first time the DNI threat report came out and it actually named countries in the threat reporting. And that was a huge deal because we used to just say persistent threat 28 or advanced persistent threat 29. And all of a sudden everyone was shocked because it came right out and said, Russia's doing this, China's doing that. The DNI annual assessment just came out, uh, I think in April of this year, and it names names and provides information and background. Um, so that information is becoming um, more available. And actually, if you go to uh, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center website, ncsc.gov, which is under the, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, they have a lot of working aids out there. They have videos, they have information. Um, the other thing that's going on is um, on the DIB side, on the defense industrial base side, you know, they uh, expanded the National Industrial S Security Program a couple of years, a few years ago to include counterintelligence. So there's actually counterintelligence tools being offered and uh, advice and assistance and some training ideas from uh, DCSA, Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency for companies in the DIB that have those unique relationships. And I know even uh, when I was still uh, active duty military, or I went to work for the National Security Agency right after 9-11, I was attending meetings with, uh, at that time it was the Defense Security Service, and they were they were actually meeting in person with companies and convening meetings and sharing information. So um, I have not participated in one in a long time, but my belief is that those are still still ongoing. So there is information and there are resources out there to help. And I, th I think there's a lot of utility to taking counterintelligence methodology and using it in the unclassified space. Um, it doesn't have to be classified. I mean, foreign intel services, 80 to 90% of what they target is unclassified. So creating awareness amongst your workforce, uh, doing multidisciplined analysis, uh, meaning your cyber data, um, other things to look at the threats to your company, all can help provide a threat picture to help uh, the decision makers in the company make rational and reasonable decisions based on threat uh, and not speculation as to where some of the threat is in the company. Well, there's some really good resources, thanks. The, the, the new executive order that, that the Biden administration just put out Early on, and, and then kind of throughout the order, it emphasizes the need for better sharing and transparency, specifically between the government and industry. So, you know, we've definitely seen seen how important that is. I, so you were talking about the government sharing our, the intelligence and counterintelligence information it has. How do we incentivize and enable transparency and sharing the other way, do you think, to get, get companies comfortable being transparent with other companies, with the government about their cybersecurity experiences? Yeah, so I've been involved in a lot of discussions um, in my, my in, not currently, but not so long ago with the Cyberspace Solarium Commission staff. And then I was involved with uh, some support to the President's National Infrastructure Advisory Council. And uh, there's a lot of uh, agreement, I think, when you look at reports from both the, the, the NIAC, the, the Cyber Solarium Report, the Defense Science Board, uh, what we need is we need a true public-private partnership, right? Um, we've gotten a lot better at sharing threat information and saying, you know, there's this threat. Uh, but now if I'm on the private sector side, and even if they give me a clearance and they brief me on the threat, or if I'm a defense uh, company and only the CEO and people work, working certain projects have clearances, we need to get better at how do we share that information more immediately with the CIOs and the staff that actually knows the technical aspects of the network and can actually mitigate the threat, right? As a, if, if I get classified information and I'm not given guidelines on how to handle it, well, it's great that I know about the threat, but I need help in understanding and how I mitigate that threat and what am I allowed to do? What am I allowed to tell my people? And I think, um, you know, when you, we keep having these discussions about shortages of of technical people. Well, that's all the more reason for us to collaborate. I mean, uh, there's a proposal on the table for a critical infrastructure command center, which um, is based uh, to some degree on the Kansas Intelligence uh, Fusion Center, KIFC, where you have private sector people with clearances and government uh, intelligence community and law enforcement in that same space with clearances. 
And instead of waiting for a report to come out, what you're doing is you're collaborating real time and developing relationships and trust to identify and to address real world threats immediately as a team. And I think that's a great start to, to building trust between the federal government and the private sector and to leverage all those um, resources because there are some very, very competent people that are uh, very good at doing their jobs on the private sector side. And I think we all benefit by leveraging, leveraging them as well as leveraging those folks that we have on the government side. So I, I think it could be a great partnership if we get all those people working shoulder to shoulder. I think the emphasis on getting it, you know, out of the classified world in a controlled way is 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 very key. That, you know, that if you if you have a company, if you're a company that that is a cleared contractor and you're doing classified work, then you have cleared people. But that's a pretty small percentage of the overall defense industrial base, and and the rest of those companies probably don't have anybody on staff with clearance. Certainly not their security team. Um, you know, if if they're not already in that intelligence world for some for some reason for, as part of the services yep. that they do. Um, so lo looking at the, the ransomware threat specifically, the, the number one response used to be restore your data from backups. And lately mm -hmm. we've seen you know, two issues with that. First, the perpetrators are starting to threaten public release of the data. You, you mentioned this earlier. So backups don't help with that. And the second uh, influence is that insurance companies have started to intervene and mandating in some cases that ransom payments be made as a way to kind of lower their potential losses so in this environment, what, yeah, what, what do you think is the appropriate response to a ransomware threat, specifically around paying ransoms? Because that's a pretty hot topic, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is just my personal opinion, but uh, you know, I support the government position that we shouldn't pay the ransom. We're just encouraging them. Um, and I think also we're starting to see more and more cases where that is not as, um, that doesn't solve the problem the way that we hope that it will, right? There's been a couple recent reports of, um, talking about the persistent access, the back doors, where a couple companies have paid ransom, um, got the networks back online, and then they got hit again with a second ransomware attack because they had persistent access. Um, you know, during the Ukraine event, one of the discussions that I was involved with too was, you know, some of the things that the malware that the Ukrainians were hit with were pretty well known. Um, and some of that almost seems like it's, um, a distraction, right? So if you're doing cybersecurity and you recognize this malware and you focus your resources on those TTPs and and modif and mitigating that threat, then uh, for a while we had this saying, we called it the pivot. What we're doing is we're missing the pivot, which is where that actor gets in either through spear phishing or through a known vulnerability. Um, but you miss that more sophisticated backdoor or that, that other action they take to have persistent access so it's almost, to me, sometimes it almost feels like it could almost be purposeful in some cases saying, hey, look over here and you won't see what we're doing over here where we want to actually stay in your network. So I, I think when it comes to ransomware, what we really got to do, have to do is work together, um, private sector, public sector, uh, academia, uh, the national laboratories. How do we establish better resiliency for the networks? Um, the backups have been threatened. Um, that doesn't mean we'd stop having the discussion about how do we do the backups. I think, how do we do the backups better? How do we do them securely? How do we take and design the networks so that we can bring them back online? It kind of goes back to that point. We're going to be had. We're going to go down at some point. The, the odds are on the adversary's um, side for the most part. So the next thing is, is part of, you know, we're, we're moving from just doing the perimeter. Now we're moving to zero trust and segmentation. While the other part of that is, how do we do resiliency better so when it does finally happen, we can recover the networks quickly and it's not ha doesn't have such a uh, major impact on critical functions of the company. Uh, and I think we've got to have more dialogue along that way going forward. You mentioned uh, you're doing research on sort of vulner vulner vulnerability science. Um, so I, how does that play into the into the resilience? I mean, I think that the, the advice so far has been patch faster. And so we're all getting way better at patching than we used to be. But is, you know, what else is in that sort of vulnerability science piece around um, making those systems more resilient at, the, at their core? Yeah, I think, uh, well, you know, and I know about being patch poor. <laughs> uh, I've heard that phrase. And I know that applying patches isn't as easy as a solution as it sounds, because I know on some of the older, larger systems, I've talked to folks that have told me, we can only patch at a certain time. We can't just patch any given day because we don't know if it's going to take the network down, if it's going to take the plant down. Um, 
So that's not something that you do lightly. And I think for the vulnerability science part, it's, um, you know, on the national lab side, the advantage we have, like in the fee, is that we do have access to intelligence information. So one is how do we take threat information and, and other information we may get on the classified side or from investigations and use that to develop, uh, conduct research and development to, to develop mitigations that could be applied in the real world in the unclassified world to the construct or, or the design of systems going forward to mitigate those threats. Um, that's one thing we could do. And then, you know, there's a program that is uh, an old DOD program that started in counterintelligence and kind of went to acquisitions and it's still out there, but it's, um, we used to call it a tech protect plan. But the other thing we can do proactively, and it's a little bit harder than it sounds is start having discussions with the people that actually operate the networks, operate the systems, operate the grid, about what are your critical functions, what are your critical components? And then what you do is you actually try to get ahead of the adversary and identify those critical components and then look at those for vulnerabilities and try to mitigate those vulnerabilities before an adversary or a criminal uh, finds them and exploits them. Um, that's not an easy thing to do. It's a little bit more sophisticated than it sounds and it takes time and resources, but um, those kinds of things are, are being worked right now in a couple of arenas and hopefully we'll have success to address that type of, that type of risk as well. Good, so this, this series um, primarily focused on CMMC, Department of Defense Initiative, you're coming from the DOE side of things. Um, besides the things that you just, you just mentioned, sort of research topics, is the DOE doing anything specifically around uh, the private sector suppliers, the, the you know, corporations? I mean, CMOC has come out of a notion that the, the contractors don't have the level of hygiene that DOD expects. They set some standards. They realized the implementation was inconsistent, spotty. And, and so they're trying to level that level that playing field out. Is, is DOE looking at their contractor base in that same way? I think absolutely. I think everyone has to. You know, we started having those discussions a while back, and then those discuss discussions gained even more emphasis after the OPM breach. Because if you remember, the OPM breach was through a subcontractor um, that followed the chain up to the database. Um, so... Um, so we were having discussions even back then. So yes, DOE is having, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the government, but uh, similar conversations about, um, and even at the national labs, we're having conversations about what type of security requirements do we extend to our subcontractors? And then, uh, you know, how can we effectively implement a, a supply chain risk management program to actually look at also who are we doing business with and where are we getting our components from? Um, because uh, when you start going too far down the supply chain, it becomes very complicated very quickly on where those parts are coming from and, and how ubiqu ubiquitous they are um, and, uh, and how do we address that threat. And that, that's definitely something I think we're all dealing with. And I know DOD is dealing with that big time um, because of the, the scope of the acquisition and logistics programs within DOD. I want to ask kind of one more how do we respond to the threat issue? What do we, you know? What do we do with our time? And then I'll, I'll have a kind of wrap up question for near the end of our time. Um, you know, the CMMC DOD has emphasized it's not a checklist. Ultimately, though, it's a it's a compliance framework. All compliance frameworks have that risk that they they lead you to simply check the boxes um, that may or may not really get to your to your cyber risk. What what's your advice for you know business leaders, security practitioners as they think about how to balance the need to defend against a very agile, sophisticated threat and the need to, um, to, to be compliant with a specific framework. You know, we want to steer away from sort of mindless checking of boxes and, and make sure that at the end of the day, we're actually deterring the adversaries. Yeah, I, I, and I agree with um, the concerns about the checklist mentality. I worry about that. In my previous position, I worried about that even with uh, some of the directives coming out of the regulators, right? That we didn't want to develop a, um, a checklist, men checklist mentality where we could just say, oh yeah, we met that. And now the regulator's happy and we can just go on our way. But in reality, our lunch is being eaten um, by foreign adversaries. And I, I think the challenge is, is uh, we need to get incentives for the private sector to develop um, security programs, both on the cybersecurity, the physical security, 
And even on the counterintelligence side, bringing in a counterintelligence piece to it that allows us to develop those agile security programs that are proactive and not just reactive and take seriously um, awareness uh, for the workforce. Um, this is a team sport. Cybersecurity can't do it alone. Physical security can't do it alone. You've got to bring all those different pieces together um, so that you can be more efficient. You know, I've had discussions about identifying the keys to the kingdom. I can't protect everything, but um, if I know where my core servers are at, uh, what am I doing on the cyber side to protect those? What am I doing on the physical side? Am I locking the cabinets? Am I controlling access to the keys? Um, you know, if I'm only focused on the cyber side, but that insider can just walk in there, um, you know, then then I've got a huge vulnerability because, you know, um, these nation states are multifaceted attacks. Um, I'm not going to come at you one way. I'm going to come at you multiple ways. So I think I think what companies need to do is start thinking about how do we grow a uh, security program? And it's really amazing if you hire the right people, how much you can do with a relatively small group. It doesn't have to be a it doesn't have to be a huge team. It's not like you have to recreate, you know, the Defense Intelligence Agency or, or CIA or NSA. We're not talking about that. Um, I've had a couple programs where actually it was advantageous, although a bit stressful to have a small group, <clears throat> because if I had the right group, everybody knew what everybody else was doing and we shared better. And we were actually much more agile and able to identify and address threats quicker than if the group became so cumbersome that I had to go through a long chain of uh, supervisors and stuff to actually get the message spread and to, and to get the mission done. So, so that's one thing I would look at if I was on the corporate side right now is how would I, how would I put that team together and what, what would I want in my team? Well, that's, that, it's a good perspective. I mean, of these 300 some thousand companies in the defense industrial base, a lot of them are, are small enough that they're lucky to have one person focused on security, certainly not a team of, 40 or 50 people like the, some of the larger, larger have, right? So, you know, can you get it done with a small team if you hire the right folks, if you have the right, the right pieces in place? That's, I, I agree with you, I think it is. Um, let me ask, we're kind of at the end of our time. Let me ask a wrap up. So I always like to ask about how we can get better results, more bang for the time and effort we're putting in. We're all resource constrained in terms of money and people. Um, so, you know, as you're watching companies respond to these events, we just talked about the, these, these recent threats, What's your one piece of advice for those who are making decisions about their cyber defenses of, of where they should, where are they going to get the best bang for their buck for the time they spend? So, you know, I'm probably a bit biased coming from the Intel side. I've been an Intel guy for 40 years now. Um, um, so, but I think what I'm seeing is as the nation state threat is evolving, um, I guess what I think where you get some bang for your buck is, You've got to bring in a couple people that bring that that Intel point of view to the problem, because what you have now is uh, first it was criminal hackers. They were they were malicious. They were defacing websites, things like that. And of course, that's still going on. And then it was stealing intellectual property. But what we're looking at now, in my mind, with some of the companies and some of the incidents that happened, it's really intelligence preparation of the battlefield. Hmm. What we now have is we have sophisticated nation state adversaries trying to get into corporate networks to not just steal proprietary information, but also to be able to take that company or that network down to affect US national security. It could be to affect continuity of the economy. It could be because I wanna make a political statement. It could be um, for a variety of reasons, but um, the other thing that's changed is the red lines have changed. You know, we used to think these things would happen during wartime or kinetic, during a kinetic uh, event. And now what you see, I think, a growing number of times where they're using cyber as a form of soft power in peacetime. So if I'm unhappy with one of your policies or if I'm unhappy with the way that you treated me, then I may retaliate. And I'm not going to go against necessarily just a government entity. I'm going to go against private sector entities, entities that are are critical to your national security or to people's confidence in the government. I mean, look at all the headlines that we got from Colonial Pipelines and, the, and all the, the lines at the gas stations. I mean, I experienced that even down in, in Tennessee and saw people in front of me filling, you know, 15 gas cans with, with gas. And uh, so I think, I think the change here to me is for companies to realize 
as painful as it may be, is I'm not just after your, these, these, they're not just after your intellectual property anymore. They're actually looking to have persistent access to your network to potentially take your operations offline at the time that they choose for reasons that we may not understand or, or, under, or, or have pre-knowledge before it happens and we'll only understand after it happens. So that changes the game a little bit. And I don't know that everyone's not used to dealing with that. So you need to start educating your really smart guys in cybersecurity and, and, and things like that, that um, the game has changed because they can address it or they have a lot of smarts to address it, but they also got to kind of know what the, what they're up against. So. Well, that intelligence preparation of the battlefield is very interesting perspective. And I think there's, yeah, that's, that's, that's very useful for sure. Um, as a, as a way to, as a way to think about what's going on and what's happening here. So, so thank you very much. You, you mentioned um, a couple of times, the cyberspace solarium commission. Uh, if anybody is interested in, in more about that, if you look at our back catalog on our website, we have this series, we had an interview with Mark Montgomery, uh, who's the executive director of that, of, of that commission, gave some really interesting insights on the, the report, but also some of the outcomes, some of the things that policy changes that have happened because of that. So um, yeah, that was you know, really pretty interesting work. Um, looking at how this stuff is happening in peacetime and, and how we could potentially respond to it in less than military ways. So yeah, it's very, very, very good reading if, if for anybody in the audience who hasn't, hasn't already checked out that Cyberspace Learning Commission. Um, that, Chuck, that's, we're at the end of our time. I need to kind of wrap this up. It's a very interesting conversation. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank Wade for drawing uh, uh, sketch notes of our, our session. I want to thank, who's waving at us. I want to thank uh, the audience for your time and, and attention. Uh, please join us for future town hall meetings. Uh, next week, we're going to be back at this uh, same time slot, Wednesday, July 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have Mike Gordon. He's CISO of Lockheed Martin Corporation. So the, the, the biggest of the bigs in terms of uh, defense industrial base is going to be your guest to talk about what they're doing with respect to CMMC for themselves and their supply chain. So it should be a very interesting session. Uh, please, if you don't have a registration information or invitations from us, please head to our website, neosystemscorp.com for those details. Thanks.